Aye. He founded one of the major ancient religions called Monachism, M-A-N-I-C-H-A-I-S-A-E-S-I-M, however you want to spell it, Monachism. The most striking principle of his theology or his philosophy was dualism, D-U-A-L, dualism. And what he said, and remember this was after the Jesus era, after that biblical era, but he said the universe is a battlefield for control between an evil material physical God and a good non-material spiritual God. So, so in other words, what he was saying is that there was two gods. One God of physical people, one God of spiritual people, and, and they're at loggerheads. Uh, that is not too unlike the philosophy of Carl Jung, who, uh, you know, uh, was the uh, psychoanalyst from the early 1900s who came to the conclusion that people have been, through religion, uh, more or less instructed to give too much homage to the physical God and not to the spiritual, not to the invisible. But anyhow. Now, Christianity or Christians recognize the evil God in Satan, but they have never been able to accept the idea that Satan has as much power as God, okay? So there's always been this du dualism to a certain extent with Christianity saying there's a devil and then there's God. But the difference with Mani, Mani said that uh, the devil or Satan is actually God in the physical realm and the quote-unquote good God is God in the spiritual. Christians held that uh, Satan, unlike God, is a created being, saying that it was God that created Satan, which would make Satan level. So the term uh, monarchistic, or however that's pronounced, is often used to describe any religion with a similar concept of the struggle between good and evil. And, and the Manichees made every effort, uh, Mani did, to include all religious traditions in their faith. And as a result, they preserved many of the uh, ancient apocryphal Christian works, such as the Acts of Thomas. Mani even at one time described himself as a disciple of Christ, but, you know, the Orthodox churches and doctrinal places rejected him as a heretic. Let's look at this. And this here, the uh, picture you'll recognize is the uh, picture of the myth of Adam and Eve. And you'll see the animals and, you know, the tree leaves are, happen to just be in the proper place, thank goodness. And, uh, and then we have up here the serpent. Now, Mani's approach, which got him in an all out, a, a whole lot of trouble, in fact, got him in so much trouble that he was executed by, by the religious uh, government of the time. But this uh, idea of Mani's was to explain the Garden of Eden as saying that it was the serpent in the tale who was the good God and that it was the God that we always worshipped and that we've always uh, saluted in our religious uh, groups as being the evil God. You, you understand? In other words, he is saying that the one that is referred to as God in the book of Genesis is really the evil satanic one and the serpent who tempted, quote unquote, Eve in the garden was really the good God. So, you know, obviously, this got him in a whole lot of trouble. Now, here's how Mani arrived at that conclusion, and it's very interesting. Mani said that the serpent told Eve 
the truth. The serpent said, look, if you take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will become as God and not die as God told you. See, God told uh, Adam and Eve that if they eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. And the serpent said, no, that's a lie. The reason they don't want you to eat that is because if you do eat that, you'll become as one of them. That's the truth. So Monty, in identifying the serpent then as the good spiritual God, made it clear that the God that we and the world identified with was the evil physical God because he lied when he told Adam and Eve, if you eat this fruit, you'll die. So, so, so that, that's, that's where Monty's logic concerning the Garden of Eden and God uh, came from, and that's how it got him in a lot of trouble. See, the, the serpent whom Mani said was the good spiritual God told Eve, look, if you eat the fruit, you are not going to die, as God said, but you would become as God's, which is true. Now, that statement about identifying which voice was the good God, the invisible one or the serpent, is borne out in the scripture. This is very interesting, and this follow where we're coming from. We're talking about, in this particular type of situation, we have God who tells Eve, if you eat you're, the fruit, you're going to die. Then we have the serpent who tells Eve, that's not true, that's a lie. If you eat the fruit, you're going to become as gods, okay? So one of these is lying, either the serpent. Now, of course, it's all mythology, understand. But what we're talking about, um, a mythology that is describing in these hidden terms, in these story-like ways, uh, a truth, a deep truth. And, 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 and so in the storyline of the myth, we have introduced to us two entities. One is God who says, if you eat it, you're going to die. The other, the serpent who said, he's lying. If you eat it, you're going to become his gods. Okay. So now we have to identify. One of these two is lying. There's no doubt about that. Either the serpent in the story is a liar, or God in the story is a liar. And, 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 and now we go into the Bible and see about lying and, and who it is that the Bible attributes lies to. So here we have in the next one, John 8, 44, you, you are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So here's the Bible telling us, okay, that the devil or Satan is a liar, okay? So that means that one of these two entities has to be Satan, according to the Bible, because one of them lied. It's either God who said, you're going to die, or it's either the serpent who said, no, you're not going to die, you're going to become as gods. So you see here, Mani is saying that the serpent is the good God because he told the truth when he said, by eating the fruit, Adam and Eve would become as gods, whereas God told them they would die. Now, let's take a look at that. In Genesis 2, 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. So here we've identified this fact. God said, you eat the fruit, you die. Genesis 3, 4, And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So, okay, one of these said you'll die, the other said you will not die, but you will become as God. So we're trying here, and this is where Monty was coming from, trying to find out who's the liar here, okay? One says you eat it, you die. The other says, no, you become as gods. So who's the liar? And remember, the Bible says Satan, the devil, 
is the father of lies. So this is the result of it, and we'll look and see who was. Genesis 3, 2, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he takes of the tree of life and eat and live forever, the Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden. So the, the end of the story was they did not die. What happened? They became as one of us, God said. They became as gods, which is exactly what the serpent said. So the serpent was telling the truth, and God was lying. And that's what Monty said. And of course, when Monty uh, brought this to the attention of the world, uh, much of the religious groups were as they are today and couldn't deal with any kind of talk like that. And they wound up ki killing him. So there is the answer. The Bible says that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. And here in this particular work, the serpent said, you will not die. You will be as gods. It was God that said you will die. And according to the Bible that you can see right in front of you, they didn't die, but became as gods. So you can see for yourself, man has become as one of us. Therefore, it was the serpent who was telling the truth. It was God who was lying. And that's why Mani said that the one that we call God is actually Satan. And that is the reason, because we worship this, this thing called God that is actually Satan, that the world is in the mess that it's in. So man is, Mani is correct, but the religious leaders of the time were totally against his teaching, and uh, they brought him to court. You can take that off. So here's this guy, Mani, and you know, he's got everybody worked up about this. because you know, So they bring him to court. And the judges there, whomever they are, said, who told you about the good spiritual God and the bad physical God? And he said, an angel told him. A spirit told him. And so they asked Monty, what was that angel's name? What was the spirit's name? We look here. According to biographical accounts preserved by Ibn Anadam and al Biruni, during his youth, Mani received a revelation from a spirit whom he called the Twin, who taught him the divine truths of religion. So, according to Mani and his ancient religion, he received this information from a spiritual realm of one whose name was. The twin. Well, once they heard that, they said, that, that's enough. You're guilty, and uh, they executed him. But he was the first to introduce us not only to this eye-opening explanation <coughs> of Genesis, but also to the concept of the twin. See, the twin suddenly brings this strange angelic visitor into the realm of the life force as understood today. Not by us. Not, not by the people did you, you know, deal with. Not by the religious people that preach. This brought into the realm of uh, the life force as understood by physicists to delve in the world of quantum, the world of the subatomic. They talk constantly about the twin. But they don't tell us so much. So you can buy books about it. But they don't tell us so much about it because it's freaky. And yet it's true. Scientifically correct. Let me show you. In the quantum world, two or more particles can share the same quantum existence, known as a wave function, giving particles that are joined at the hip in this way extraordinary properties. 
Measuring one of these quantum twins instantaneously determines the quantum state of the other, even if they are opposite sides of the universe. OK? Now, imagine that. That when you, let's say, this is the universe. This is one side. That's where we are. And say this is the other side of the universe where you know infinity is. If you do anything with that here, it is going to affect that there, even though they're not connected. And there's no question. There's not a. There's no question about this. You know. You know. People don't question this. Of course, religious people don't talk about it because they're they're not they're not aware of it. But in other words, I mean, if we boil this down, what it's saying is there are absolute twi uh, 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 twins that share the same existence. And this is the question that I would have for you. I want you to consider that when you go to bed and dream, is it you experiencing that? Or is it your other self, the twin, who is experiencing that? We have discussed quantum teleportation in the past, but uh, it would be well to just look at it again for a few minutes in light of what Mani was saying back in 200 AD, that the angel who told him was someone called the twin. Now, d d teleportation is a science fiction staple. I mean, really, people and objects suddenly disintegrate in front of your eyes. They're beamed across the universe in the blink of an eye, and then they're reconstructed on a remote planet. The trouble is, fundamental physics has always said teleportation cannot possibly work until recently, that is. Let's uh, look at this next. It's possible to prepare two particles, and we'll call them P and Q, and say in such a way that they're intimately related. In other words, they're, they're like entangled, like quantum twins. Let's separate P and Q, OK? So we separate them apart and send them as far apart as we like to the ex other ends of the universe from one another. They are still both in the indeterminate state. Now let's measure P and say we discover it's in state 0. Instantaneously. This means that particle Q, which may be light years away at the other side of the universe, on the other, instantly assumes the opposite state. It's now definitely spinning as a one. Entanglement has been known theoretically for decades, but it's only recently been proven by experiment. So what we're talking about here is not something that, well, maybe, or I don't know if I believe that. That's gone. This is fact. This is proven in an experiment or experiments that done by quantum physicists who communicate this stuff to one another, OK? So as soon as we observe one, it affects the other instantaneously, trillions and trillions and trillions of light years away totally not connected. But yes, they have to be connected. In some way, there has to be a connection, even though they're not connected. And they're trillions of light years away from one another. And so then in the physicist's world, they refer to them as quantum twins. And I'll tell you something. And the reason we talk about this, and the reason I talk about this, because it has a definite impact. Who are you, really? You know, it's like I said, when you're, you're, you're going to bed and you're sleeping and you're having this fantastic thing going on, what has happened? Have we put you to sleep here? And as a result, have we then awakened you there? 
And is your quote unquote experience trillions of light years away? This is, this, is, this is a good way to understand it. It's done by physicist Jeff Kimball from Caltech. And this is what he says, and this is the best way to sum it up. Entanglement means if you tickle one, the other one laughs. Says Caltech physicist Jeff Kimball, one of the researchers to first demonstrate entanglement in the lab. If you tickle one over here on this side of the universe, the one on the other side of the universe. Now, of course, this is beyond our ability to comprehend this. It sounds bizarre. It sounds ridiculous. But it's true. And it's scientifically proven. And that's why it can't be put down by religious groups. And, and yet, where, where we would say this is bizarre, we will file into church and listen to all kinds of things, like talking snakes and all of this stuff, and say, oh, yes, 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 that's, I believe that. There's no question about it. I'm saved. So let me think about this. If you tickle one on this side of the universe and the other one laughs, or if you observe one on this side of the universe and the other one changes in some way, if you put one to sleep here, does that wake the other there? So that what you are experiencing in a dream is a reality taking place on the other side of the universe. They'll say, well, I, 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 I don't believe that. But you can't say that in the world of quantum because you don't know. Nobody knows anything about that. The world of quantum physics Take science, and Albert, you can sit down here. Albert's a scientist. You could sit down here and talk with him. But the world of quantum physics takes science and turns it upside down. It does. It's, I'll tell you how bizarre it is. It is so bizarre that Albert Einstein said, forget it already. I don't want to know from this. I'm out of here. Goodbye. He quit. Because you know what Albert Einstein said this was? He called it. He coined the phrase. He said, this is spooky action at, ex at a distance. I don't want to know from this. And he quit. But something happens. Something happens. There is another you, maybe 10 of you. It doesn't have to be to just one. And you say, well, I, <coughs> how, could, how could I be here? And how could I be there? Because it's the way it is. Because quantum proves that's the way it is. Because atoms, every single atom has twins. And you're atoms. So you have that twin. And so then, when the body dies here, life goes on there. And there you are. Still in same you. The same exact you. Twins are spoken of in the Bible, Jacob and Esau. One was favored as doing what was right. The other was not and considered doing what was wrong. But that's mythology. Is that speaking of quantum entanglement? Could that be speaking of quantum entanglement? Because those stories aren't literal. It never happened. Quantum entanglement, which is the twin at the other side of the universe, your twin. I don't mean the twin, that there's a twin somewhere. I'm saying your twin, you, the exact you, someplace else. Well, a little later on, I'm going to get into real, real heavy duty stuff about time travel and. The one question I have, and I have to ask this guy, David Deitch, who we'll introduce you to in a minute, is if I time travel, could I run into myself? Oh, what we don't know is amazing. What we do know is superstitions from the Middle Ages of Europe that we call religion. So what does science say? about that. Look, so you can teleport an atom, and people are made of atoms. 
<coughs> so well, the answer to the obvious question is, who knows? You can already try quantum computation for yourself by running a simulator on your PC. As for teleporting yourself across the universe, you might have to wait a little longer. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Well, I don't think that that'll ever happen. But that's some guy said that a long time ago. Well, one day there'll be phones and people can walk around with them and not have any wires attached to them and talk to people in India. Oh, that's ridiculous. And one day there'll be computers and one day there'll be the internet and all of this stuff. Oh, I don't believe in that. Well, you have to wait a little longer. But one day you will teleport yourself to another parallel universe. What do you think is going to happen through uh, 100 years, 200, 300, 1,000 years? What do you think is going to happen? What happened 100 years ago, they didn't even have a light bulb already. And now, more stuff happened in the last 75 years than happened in the first 300 million years. So that was uh, the guy that uh, said that is Toby Howard, who is an instructor at the University of Manchester. So he says, as for teleporting yourself across the universe, you have to wait a little while longer. They're working out the kinks. The bottom line here is the scientific reality of there being more than one of you living in a parallel universe. This is not scientific or science fiction. This is scientific reality. There has to be more than one of you. And I hold to the thought that most evident event that occurs to all of us is during what we call a dream. When the you here shuts down and the you there activates. You know what I'm saying, Sandy? Look, you're laying down, you're going to sleep. You're going to sleep. All of a sudden, there's another you. Meeting people you never saw before. Going places you've never seen before. What's going on here? That you in that supposed dream is just as real and just as vibrant and just as involved as the you lying in that bed. See? So then when that body finally goes, dies, can no longer hold that you the you that is in that dream or whomever is carrying on and off you go and you're continuing on business as usual. I'd like to introduce you to another scientist who is considered an expert in the field in his name and you might want to look him up. His name is, not yet, and his name is David Deutsch. He's a character. But he doesn't, I, I have not been able to see where he takes drugs like uh, John Lilly or, uh, or, or the other guys that we're talking about. He, he ha oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sir William Crooks. You remember we talked about Sir William Crooks who brought Katie King back from the dead and she stood next and he had a doctor take her pulse. And of course everybody said he was nuts. But they had a tough time because he was the most prestigious scientist from uh, the uh, 19th century. And they all looked down at him and said, Sir William Crooks, are you going to say it's possible for a dead person to come back and stand right in this room and you could take her pulse? You're going to say it's possible? He said, no, I didn't say it was possible. I said it happened. And he said, I have discovered one of the greatest forces in the universe. What had he discovered? Had he discovered a long time ago this question of teleportation, quantum teleportation? When just before he died, and they, they, he came in, they brought him into Parliament in England, and they wanted all to hear him say, hey, look, I'm sorry. I, he said, I've been taking heat from you people for 30 years, and I'm just here on my last day to say, I don't retract a word. This guy that discovered the cathode ray tube for x-rays and thallium and all this stuff. Brilliant person. Jeremy Norby, who took Ayasuka because he said he had to find out how come uh, people out in the jungle, in the Amazon, 
knew how to take a plant here and then combine it with a plant in the middle of the jungle and heal people. And he sat down with these people and the, they didn't have any pants on and everything. He said, how could you people be pharmaceutical experts? How, how do you know to take which plants? And they said, does there smoke in a way? The plants told us. So Narby said, the plant told He says, yeah, the plants tell us. But, you know, all of the great the leading drug companies send their experts over to the Amazon to talk to these people. Everything you have on the, you know, you might have something that's got a, a fancy name on the shelf, but it more than likely came from some guy with no pants on in the middle of the Amazon jungle or hooking up one plant. So Narby took what they took. He took the Ayasuka, and he started to see all the serpents and the dragons talking to him, and he realized what had happened was it was the DNA from the plant talking to the DNA in these people. And that's how they knew. Jeremy Narby uh, has his book out. And it's, it's, it's really one you want to find. Carl Jung, uh, one of the great psychoanalysts uh, 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 of the early 1900s, took drugs. And they said, Carl, you're the most brilliant psychoanalyst. You're a friend of Sigmund Freud and all these people. What the hell are you doing? He said, I'll tell you something. I've got to be able to see for myself what these people are talking about. And he did. And we talked last week about John Lilly. And John Lilly had the same thing. He studied the human brain. And he wanted to see what's, what the heck is out there. What's, and so he took drugs. And uh, he was able to scientifically uh, you know, write books and volumes about all of these various things and actually went out and talked to extraterrestrials and so forth and so on. Oh, once again, everybody said, oh, he's nuts like William Crooks is nuts. But there's a difference. See, these guys have scientific credentials and they're into science and, and they explain things. And there's things going on. And I think one of the greatest lines that John Lilly had, they said, Dr. Lilly, what has to be done to people to get them to understand? He says you have to take every one of them and hit them over the head with a hammer. It's because they don't. There's no way that they'll ever understand as long as they come under the, the teaching and the instruction that is given to them now. So I introduce you to another scientist. I know nothing. I don't think he takes drugs. I, don't, <laughs> I haven't seen anything. But he is an expert in the quantum field. And his name is David Deutsch. Looks like a little, a little bit strange, but maybe not. <laughs> David Deutsch's research in quantum physics has been influential and highly acclaimed. His papers on quantum computation laid the foundations for that field, breaking new ground in the theory of computation as well as physics. And he's triggered uh, an explosion of research worldwide. His work revealed the importance of quantum effects in the physics of, ready for this, time travel. And he is an authority on the theory of parallel universes. He was born in Haifa, Israel. He was ed educated at Cambridge University and Oxford University. And after several years at the University of Texas at Austin, he returned to Oxford, where he now lives and works. And he is a member of the Quantum Computation and Cryptography Research Group at Clarendon Laboratory, Oxford University. So he's got the credentials. But he will say things that are so far beyond uh, the people that we listen to for instructions about uh, the spirit realm and the angelic realm and the God realm and the universe and oh, you know, well, I believe I got faith. We don't even know this man. But let's see what he says. Our twins in the parallel universes are just as real as we are, says David Deutsch. The notion that our world is somehow more real is derived not from experience, since each world seems equally real to its inhabitants, nor from quantum mechanics. In an absolute sense, there are no splits at all and no moment when your unseen counterparts can no longer affect you. No moment when your unseen counterparts can no longer affect you. In other words, 
what David Deutsch is saying is that you also live in another universe and are doing something right now different than what you're doing here and have no knowledge of the fact that you're sitting in the chair here and it, yet it is you. Our twins in the parallel universes are just as real as we are. Now you can turn around and say, well, that's not what father so-and-so or pastor so-and-so, he, he was, you know, I, I'm, I don't bring you those people. I bring you people that have the credentials and have the training to explore. This guy has the training and he's a preeminent scientist in that world of the subatomic, of the quantum, uh, of that invisible realm of, of the atom and so forth. He's not crazy, he's not a radical, he's a physicist and a quantum physicist who opens the curtain on an existence that none of us could even conceive exists, but one which certainly can clarify biblical references and our own obsessions with spirits and angels. I mean, people go into churches and you see pictures of angels and spirits and they're all singing and they're waving their arms and smoke is flying and all of this stuff. And this guy knows what it is. I felt something telling me this. Who did? Maybe it was yourself. I mean, you see what I'm saying? These are real people. Our twins in parallel universes, our existence is not only in this physical reality, but in another physical reality as well. And see, see what got me, how, how often do we see this word twins? Bonnie, who explained Genesis and the reality that it was the serpent in the mythology who was the good guy and God that we worship who was the devil, he got killed. And who told him all about this stuff? The twin. That's what's so interesting about it. I, and what you should do, you know, you listen to me rant on and all, and I understand that, but you should look up David Deutsch on your computer. You should look up the twin. Look up the twin, and then uh, put twin, and then next to it put the uh, quantum. Put twin quantum next to it. Now look yourself. You know, sometimes when we feel the way we do, we have a difficult time figuring out why. Everything seems to be gone okay, but still in spite of that, we may feel down. And, and there's no explanation, you know? It, it, we just don't, we don't feel right. What's going on? That's what Deutsch says. To the extent that your decisions depend on random events, there are indeed equally real versions of you in other universes who chose differently and are now enduring the consequences. Whoa! To the extent that the decisions you make right here depend on random events because, you know, you never know what the heck's going to happen. Something happens, you say, geez, you know, I better do this or I better do that, and you know, I'm going to do this, I'm, you know, I don't know. There are other equally real versions of you in other universes who chose differently and are now enduring the consequences. You screwed something up and you're having a heck of a hard time and you're down and you're crying and whatever's going on someplace else and could that unraveling come right back to you and you say you know everything's going good but still I feel lousy I don't feel good I don't know why it is because what he's saying you're having a hell of a hard time someplace else isn't that something? oh well, I don't believe this <laughs> I believe the snake really was <laughs> talking to Eve and how are you gonna, are you gonna, what are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to question this? You can't question this guy's credibility. You can't question his credentials. Any more than you can credential William Crook. You're going to believe? I, when I'm here, I show pictures of William Crooks 
and a doctor taking Katie King's pulse, and he said this lady was dead and she came back. She's got her gown on and they're taking her pulse. You're going to believe it? You're not going to believe that. But you know what? You can't question this guy's credentials. And who, who tells you this? Nobody tells you this stuff is going on. This thing, David Deutsch, uh, these words, he's not making a speech to people. He's talking to other physicists. They're talking back and forth. This isn't stuff that uh, he, he's, he's telling you. You don't know who this guy is. But you saw his credentials. So he says, you may be doing very well here, but you're all screwed up someplace else, and it could be leaking back here, so that's why you feel rotten even though everything's good. Another version of you and me in another real existence making a decision on something that has a negative effect. And so then the, the, the question would be, could that effect actually enter into our other psyche here? Wow. If we could be affected by ourselves running into some kind of a problem someplace else, that we don't even know that we have a twin someplace else. If that's possible, that would open up all kinds of possible solutions to the question of puzzling behavior, wouldn't it? Why do people do the things they do? Why do people feel the way they do? And you're not going to get your psychiatrist or your counselor or your psychologist or anybody to talk about this. They don't know anything about it. They don't know that this exists, and yet it's true. This is not something that was dreamed up. As I said, this is something that put Albert Einstein out of business because he, he knew it was true, but he couldn't deal with it. This is something, uh, uh, you know, people like Niels Bohr or David Bohm, I mean, prestigious people who, who know that these are true, that these are facts. This is scientific fact. This is something that goes on in the invisible world that we inhabit that we know nothing about. You know, sometimes you just have to say, you know, I feel the way I do, and how, how you know, wh why, why, how could I possibly have a twin? But if all atoms have twins, how could I possibly not have a twin? He's shaking his head yes, because he knows. And I respect his opinion, but he's a scientist, but he knows. See? Every atom has a twin, and that's all you are. So I am. Look what he says, David Deutsch. Photons, atoms, and quantum computations have invisible, differently behaving counterparts. But you still cling to the belief that you exist in only one copy. Now, I don't think this makes sense because you are made of atoms, and if they have invisible counterparts, so must you. Okay. That changes the whole thing. From the time that you first walked, that they took you to church, your mother and father took you to church, now you're saying, holy gee, what is this? They never told me I had a twins. What? I don't know from this. What is this? Isn't it great? And that's why it's so meaningful. Like Spider-Man, when we say, Monty says this, bang, twins, and then we got twins all over the place. So here is the basis on which our multiple existence is founded. It is based on the scientific fact. Scientific fact, and you should write that down in your head. Scientific fact that atoms have twins so that we who are atoms must have twins. Let me see what David Deutsch says again. What quantum mechanics describes is not a single universe, but something that is constantly branching into different worlds, in one of which I am speaking to you, in another of which I am speaking to someone else. Yeah. 
Reality consists of a multiverse, an enormous entity which on a gross scale has a structure that resembles many copies of the universe of classical physics, but which is on a sufficiently fine scale, a single unified system. Oh, okay. It's not, it's not really, that, that is not really as complex as it might initially seem to you. What he's saying is, even though there are multiple universes, parallel universes, universes all over the place, it's still one. It is still one. It's still interconnected. It's still interrelated. And that's why you're a twin and you could have an interrelationship, say. And, and it could account for things that are, you know, beyond our conception. Now, you say, well, this, <laughs> this is terrible. We don't know anything about this. We haven't evolved to the point to know anything about this. We didn't know anything about computers 100 years ago. We didn't know anything about cell phones. We didn't know anything about television or any of those things. We do now, and we're going to know about, and, and, and in the future, we're going to know about teleportation, and we're going to teleport ourselves to these places. D David Deutsch and some of these other physicists were talking about, well, you know, we've got, we, we got to make some, some laws have to be made up here, because quantum does not allow you to go into another universe and do something that will affect or change here. Let me, let me give you an example. I will show you this one. Let's say you don't like your family. Well, what you could do is teleport yourself, find your grandfather, and kill him before he has any children. <laughs> oh, no, that, that, that's, that is, that's called the grandfather paradox, and it is a paradox that quantum physicists study. But see, the thing is, quantum, uh, the universe won't allow you to do that. Or you could go to the other universe, and maybe you think you're going to kill you, but you're going to be mistaken. You're not going to be able to, because you're not going to be able to do anything in that other universe that can disturb the effect. Oh, if you, if you went in and, you know, just killed somebody, you could have an effect there, but not after that person has already had an effect here. You see? I don't entirely, but I mean... You, 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 you see where they're coming from. So here we, we enter into the existence of a world order that is far and beyond our fantasy to conceive. Our vibrations, our thoughts, our impulses, our electricity, constantly branching into different worlds in which we are operating as real as the one we are operating here. In other words, you are now at this very moment doing something somewhere else which is not related to what you're doing here. You know? In other words, <clears throat> I can't even explain that any, an, anymore. I mean, it, that's what's being said. You are doing something else some other place. And you're just as aware of it as you are here. And you have no idea there that you're sitting in this room listening to this ranting and raving going on in this little thing here. You, you don't know that. But as the second paragraph says, in spite of the fact that there are so many universes, there is still a single unified system. So then the condition can exist that though we don't know what we're currently doing someplace else, its effects on us can transcend the world, that world into this world and vice versa. Because the system is one. Let's look what David Deutsch says. Despite the fact that quantum mechanics picks out no one of these worlds or branches as special people, still want to believe that these other worlds do not exist in the way that this one does. I mean, what he's saying is, there's no doubt about this. I mean, quantum, in the labs, quantum physicists, these very prestigious people have proved that this is the case. There's no, there's no question about it. But nobody wants to believe that because it, it, it turns 
our whole traditional concepts of what is upside down, it surely follows that the thing that singles out our own branch as more real than all the others is nowhere to be found in quantum mechanics. In other words, there is nothing. How do you prove that uh, our our universe is more real than some other. Nor is it, of course, anywhere to be found in our experience, since each one of these worlds seems equally real to its inhabitants. So in other words, you, in another universe, don't believe that you are here any more than you in this universe believe that you are there. And, and how does anybody prove this? Where is it to be found? People can talk about heaven, people can talk about hell as real places, but when they are faced with the existence of a parallel universe, not only, uh, with not only real people living in them who are actually twins of themselves, they can't deal with it. But quantum physics says, oh, this is absolutely true. And in the second paragraph, the question is, where can we find the reality of this? Since we experience absolute reality, we can't consider that the other reality exists, even though it does. So where do we look? And this is what David Deutsch says. He says, it is found, or rather demanded, by philosophy. And in particular, I believe by the sterile philosophy of positivism and related doctrines that have been impeding scientific progress for the last 70 odd years. You have it going on right now with the stem cell stuff. It, it, you know, whatever the church says. The, uh, the groups that were responsible for labeling the Middle Ages the Dark Ages, whatever they say. And they have, they're totally ignorant of this stuff. And that's why David Deutsch says they have impeded progress in science for 70 years. So let's take a look at that word. Po positivism. Positivism. The theory, and, and, and this is what he said is wrong, the theory that genuine knowledge is acquired by science and that metaphysical speculation has no validity. See? He said, that's wrong. And that's where, that's where we have a problem. We have a problem in literalism, positivism, also in religion, and also in our, in our government and in the world as we live it. Now, the word metaphysics, it says here that metaphysics has no validity. The branch of philosophy that examines the nature of reality, including the relationship between mind and matter, substance and attribute, fact and value. In other words, what, what we do here mainly, and when we look at the Bible, and, and then when we look at the, the scientists, and I try to bring to you things that coordinate the two, that bring the two together to show you, that's metaphysics. Okay, and, and what David Deutsch is saying, that where you have these kind of doctrinal institutions that refute metaphysics, that do not allow branching out of the mind into these universes and, and, and exploring these things, they destroy. You can't, there's no way you can know. There's no way that you can know and be sure that when your body wears out, the, the twin your other self goes right on, and you're there, and totally filled with knowledge. So let us look once again at what Deutsch identifies as the problem with understanding the twin. Okay, and he says right here, it is found or demanded by philosophy, the sterile philosophy of positivism, and I just explained what that is. In other words, physical reality, what I can see, and nothing else. And related doctrines that have been impeding scientific progress for the last 70 years. And that's the reason we are ignorant about these things, about ourselves, and about the nature of life, and about understanding the invisible world, is because of doctrines that refute the need to investigate the subatomic the invisible, those doctrines that refute the need for us to enter within ourselves, which is the Bible says, and which Krishna says, and which Buddha says, enter within yourself, find the center, and then you begin to find yourself and the twin. Religious doctrines say that there is no way, but their way. They place everything in the subatomic realm as belonging to religious principles, and so there's never a way 
to understand the existence of other worlds or parallel universes. We are, we are raised in the traditional way, and if you flaunt that, the same thing happens as happened to Monty. Well, they don't kill people nowadays. In some places they do, but you know, you're ostracized. But the problem with their approach to reality is that once you go into the subatomic world of quantum, it turns science upside down. The reality of science does not apply in the quantum world. But that is where you exist. You exist inside of this body. You exist inside of your body. I mean, you got all of this stuff, all of this, excuse the M-E-A-T meat stuff, and, and you wave it around and all, but there's something inside that is not of that. There is something inside that's invisible, that operates this thing in the same way that you sit down and operate a computer. You can read about people in the Bible that were supposedly dead suddenly showing up. They're going to have dinner and the whole bit. Moses, there was a story, what's termed a transfiguration, of Moses who physically shows up. He's been dead thousands of years. Look, suddenly he shows up. Where did he come from? Matthew 17, and after six days, Jesus took Peter and James, his brother John, brought them up into a high mountain and was transfigured, and his face shone as the sun and there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. Talk. Where the heck did these guys come from? Where did these guys come from? Nobody asks. Oh, it's a miracle. Well, David Deutsch would tell you. They teleported. They've been dead for thousands of years, but that's, they're not, never were dead. They teleported. Now, of course, this scene here you're looking at is mythology. It didn't actually happen. But could it be referring to the appearance of those from a parallel universe? Given the reality of quantum mechanics, the death on this plane would simply reinforce the life and the other. And what science would come into play that would allow our twin from a parallel universe then to appear here? What's, why, no, why couldn't that put that referring to? But as Deutsch said, as long as you have religion to say this is evil and all of that kind of stuff, then there's no possibility of understanding reality. Could Katie King, who William Crooks had appear from the dead, could she have been c consistent with the uh, appearance of Moses here? Moses showed up. Here he is. He's been dead thousand years. Katie King was only dead, what, I don't know how long. Well, when Moses shows up, the religious people say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus. I believe this, I'm saved. Katie King shows up, he's a nut. He must be crazy. Let's look at the paradox of time travel. What if you found a portal to a parallel universe? If you would like information about hidden meanings, please call our answering service at area code 609-971-0537 and we would be happy to mail the information to you. The center is located at the Village Green Shopping Center, Route 9, Forkett River, Exit 74 of the Garden State Park. For information, please call our answering service at area code 609-971-0537.